Hello and welcome to the review of Costanza's physiology textbook. In this video, we're going over the second part of chapter one, which is all about action potentials and neurotransmitters. If you have not seen the previous video or read the previous portion of this chapter, then I do encourage you to do so because you'll need to know some of those concepts to understand the action potential. So we kind of jump straight into describing what the resting membrane potential is. And the resting membrane potential takes into account all of the ions that are trying to move across that membrane. And that can be represented by either the conductance equation, which weighs the equilibrium potential for each ion and its relative conductance across the membrane, because remember each individual ion has its own Nernst potential, its own concentration gradient and electrical potential driving it in one direction or the other. So we have to take into account every single ion. The Goldman equation is the same as the chord conductance equation, but instead of looking at the actual conductance of the ion, you're just looking at its permeability. So it shows that we have to take into account the relative concentrations and movement of potassium, sodium, chloride, and calcium. Now on the nerve axon, and to keep things simple, you really only have to worry about sodium and potassium. So if this is our membrane, and we have the inside of the cell over here and the outside of the cell over here, we have a high concentration of sodium on the outside and a high concentration of potassium on the inside, developed because of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Remember, pumping out three sodiums and two chlorides. So the sodium potassium ATPase pump establishes this concentration gradient. Now clearly, because we have a lot of sodium on the outside, it's going to want to come inside and then potassium is going to want to go outside. Remember, the movement of a charged particle will bring with it an electrical charge. So as potassium tries to leave, it will take a positive charge outside of the cell, lowering the inside membrane potential or reducing our resting membrane potential. We always refer to the membrane potential as the charge within the cell. Sodium, on the other hand, wants to bring the positive charge inside, which will make it go more positive. The biggest difference here is that in a resting state, we do have a potassium channel that allows potassium to leave the cell, which means that on the inside, the large factor is that potassium is leaving, taking with it a positive charge. So the resting membrane potential is actually negative 90 millivolts, whereas sodium is effectively impermeable. So there is no movement of sodium into the cell at a resting state. So our resting membrane potential sits at around negative 70 millivolts, because of this leakage of potassium outside of the cell. So now that we know that concept, we have to talk about an action potential. And an action potential is purely a phenomena where excitable cells have a rapid depolarization followed by repolarization. Depolarization means that this becomes positive or at least less negative. So there is a movement of the membrane potential to becoming less negative. So that is depolarization. And then repolarization is reestablishing or becoming more negative. So reestablishing the resting membrane potential. So an action potential is just creating a positive or less negative resting membrane potential that then swings back to being repolarized. Hyperpolarized just means it's becoming more negative. So it's even lower than the resting membrane potential, let's say negative 90 instead of negative 70. An inward current is just describing a positive charge entering the cell. So bringing with it a positive charge. So that will help to bring the resting membrane potential less negative and help to depolarize the membrane. Membrane. Clearly our inward current is going to be if sodium's able to enter the cell that's going to be an inward current bringing with it a positive charge and making this less negative or more positive. An outward current is just the opposite so a flow of positive charge out of the cell hyperpolarizing the cell. So this is an outward current potassium leaving taking with it a positive charge and making it more negative. Threshold potential just describes the minimum value to create an action potential. So what that means is that usually it's around negative 50. So this has to increase, the resting membrane potential has to increase or become less negative to negative 50 millivolts in order for an action potential to occur, okay? Now this is important to understand that we need to reach this threshold for an action potential to occur. And we will go over very shortly 
exactly how an action potential develops. So a resting membrane potential needs to reach threshold, which will then allow depolarization. And then overshoot is just that the action potential becomes more positive than it wanted to. Undershoot or hyperpolarization, as it kind of describes, meaning that it's becoming more negative at rest. And then the last definition here is the refractory period, which is the period in which a normal action potential cannot be elicited. So there's going to be a time point when you can't stimulate another action potential, even with a strong enough stimulus, and we'll go over why that is. So next we actually have to talk about the action potential itself. There are some characteristics of action potentials, and it's easier to understand this by looking at this graph, where we've actually graphed out where our voltage is on the side here, so our voltage of our membrane potential, remember, meaning the inside of this cell membrane, and then over time. So an action potential is characterized by this negative 70 becoming more positive, or less negative, having this huge upswing, and then having a repolarization period, meaning that it's going to become more negative again, so coming right back down. We have this period of hyperpolarization, where it's more negative, and then it becomes normal resting membrane potential. So the two major players here are kind of as you would expect, sodium and potassium. So we have sodium entering the cell, which allows the depolarization, and then we have potassium leaving the cell to cause repolarization. So it's easier to graph this out here where we have the outside and inside of our cell. We actually have the sodium channel here, which has this gate. As soon as our resting membrane potential reaches threshold or becomes less negative, this gate actually opens up, which allows sodium to enter the cell rapidly. And this rapid influx of sodium brings with it that positive charge, allowing depolarization to occur. Now, at the same time as this open gate or activation gate opening, we also have another gate, which is normally open, called the inactivation gate, also gets stimulated to close at the same time that resting membrane potential becomes less negative, but it's just much slower. So it just takes some time. So in this time point between this gate that wants to close and then the open gate opening quickly, sodium rapidly rushes in and then eventually this inner activation gate closes, stopping that sodium from entering the cell. As you can see here, our sodium conductance rapidly reduces. So then that stops the continuous rise right up to the nerd potential of sodium. So we end up just falling short of that. And then roughly at the same time, we have another potassium channel also has its own gate, which is normally closed in the resting cell that starts to slowly open as soon as the threshold is reached, similar to the inactivation gate of the sodium. So once it's open, we have this huge additional increase in potassium leaving the cell, which correlates to the potassium conductance increasing over here that helps to repolarize the cell, so allowing it to become negative again. Now it does overshoot and it makes it become pretty close to the potassium equilibrium or Nernst potential, but then this will slowly close once again and then stop the additional potassium from leaving and then we just end up with our normal slow leak of potassium during our resting membrane potential. Now the reason we have a refractory period is because once this gate opens, because threshold is reached, Remember, this gate is also going to close slowly. So as soon as this has opened and this is closed, we end up in a state where this one carrier protein has its closed inactivation gate and open activation gate. And so sodium cannot enter the cell at this point. So it doesn't matter if there's another stimulus because there's no sodium that's going to enter. This gate will not open until repolarization and the resting membrane potential has been reestablished. So once depolarization has occurred, you need repolarization to occur to allow these carrier proteins to become sensitive to another stimulus to allow another action potential. So that's why we end up with a refractory period. And so the reason why the action potential propagates is that this membrane goes on for a while in the nerve cell. So as soon as an action potential happens at this one site and this becomes positive, this positive charge leaks over to over here where we have a slight negative charge because these guys haven't opened until this negative charge becomes negative 50 or our threshold, which will then open up these gates over here and slowly close these ones as a side. So, and allow sodium to enter and then depolarize this area. And as this area starts to enter its repolarization phase. So this positive charge gets spread from one side to the other. And that describes one of the properties of an action potential, meaning that it propagates 
The other characteristic is that the normal action potential of a certain cell looks identical, so it's always going to look like this, coming this nice depolarization and repolarization phase. And then the last characteristic, so three characteristics of an action potential, is that it's an all or nothing response. So once an action potential starts, you're not going to just get a small one, you're going to open up all your sodium channels once the threshold is reached and bang, you've got an action potential that spreads down the nerve. We create action potentials in nerves because it helps to transfer information down a nerve. So for instance, any sensory stimuli that you feel, whether that's pain, pressure, warmth, that gets spread to your brain through your nerves by the transmission of action potentials. It's the same for all your muscle movements. Your brain tells your muscles to move by sending these transmissions as action potentials through your nerve fibers to your muscle cell to then contract your muscle cell. So it's the way that we're able to transmit signals around the body. And briefly before we move on, we do have two types of refractory periods. We've got the absolute refractory period, which just represents the time point where those inactivation gates on the sodium channel are actually closed. So we literally cannot do anything about this. We can't create another action potential because this is only going to open once we repolarize the cell. Then we have a relative refractory period. Relative meaning that we may be able to re-stimulate another action potential, but it requires a higher than normal stimulus. And that's because our potassium conductance is so high that we have this strong outward current countering any inward current that may occur. So you need a higher inward current or a higher stimulus to overcome this high potassium and high outward current. But it's still possible to spread an action potential with a higher than normal stimulus. Now we can describe accommodation real quickly here. Accommodation just means that although we may be at resting membrane potential, an action potential does not occur. And the reason behind this is if we have a very slow rise from negative 70 to negative 50, that takes a lot of time, we start to actually open up only some of these sodium channels and subsequently also closing some of them that eventually once we're actually sitting at threshold, we have a lot of sodium channels which are actually closed. So then we need to actually increase even further or make this less negative even more to try to stimulate even more sodium channels for opening. So because this inactivation gate closes at the same time that the sodium channel opens. So if we're sitting at a slightly less negative resting membrane potential for a long period of time, or if it takes a long period of time to reach this negative 50, then we may not stimulate an action potential. And that's called accommodation. And that can occur due to hyperkalemia, because if we have high potassium outside of the cell, then we actually reduce this conductance, we reduce this outward current, so then our resting membrane potential sits normally at, let's say, threshold. So it's actually sitting at a less negative value, which means that we need a higher stimulus, we need a greater increase in resting membrane potential, or make this even less negative than it is right now to stimulate more sodium channels from opening. Now all of these concepts, action potentials, are quite confusing, especially when you first go over it. So I do want to encourage you to go over this video multiple times. We still have more to cover. Those are the main points. Um, or you know, read certain portions multiple times because it can be very confusing in those very first times that you actually learn about this because it doesn't seem very intuitive initially. I hope this portion has helped. Definitely go over it again if need be. But for now, we're going to move on to the actual movement of these action potentials down a nerve fiber, starting with conduction velocity. So conduction velocity just describes how fast that action potential can move down a nerve axon. Now a nerve axon is shown here on this nerve cell. So we have this nerve cell where this cell body would be sitting somewhere near the spinal cord, and then we have this long axon that goes all the way out to the sensory receptors. The sensory receptors may be all the way out to your fingertips. So these axons can get quite long, and obviously it's important for for reflexes and for movement for this velocity of conduction to be as fast as possible. So there's two main variables that determines this conduction velocity. And that includes time constant 
and length constant. And these two factors represent the cable properties of nerve axons. So if we go into time constant first, time constant just literally means how quickly can the cell membrane depolarize? Or conversely, how quickly can it hyperpolarize or repolarize? So how fast can the movement of ions occur? It's dependent on two factors. One, membrane resistance. Obviously, if we have a higher resistance in the membrane, we have a slower depolarization and repolarization phase. And then the second factor is membrane capacitance. Membrane capacitance just describes the ability of the cell membrane to actually store the charge. So if this charge quickly dissipates, then it's going to be a lot harder to depolarize the cell. But if this charge stays in the area, then you can depolarize it faster because you can increase that resting membrane potential the threshold faster and then depolarize the cell faster too. Now the other constant is the length constant. The length constant describes how quickly the depolarizing current can spread along the nerve. So length constant is going from here to here, whereas time constant is purely just depolarization at one certain point. Now length constant is dependent on the membrane resistance and then also the resistance within the cell itself. Because electrical charge likes to take the path of least resistance, whichever is lower is going to represent where that charge goes. So if you have a lower internal resistance within the cell than your membrane resistance, then your charge is going to spread quickly through the cell, which is what we want. Whereas if you have a low membrane resistance, then your charge is going to go through your cell and you're going to lose your ability to move your charge quickly down your axon. So we can improve our length constant, which will subsequently increase our conduction velocity by reducing the internal resistance or the resistance within the cell relative to the membrane resistance. And we can do that by increasing the nerve diameter, which then reduces our internal resistance within the cell, allowing the conduction velocity to increase or by myelinating the cell. Myelinating just means wrapping an insulator around it. This insulator is basically just lipid. So by wrapping an insulator around the cell, you increase your membrane resistance relative to your internal resistance within your cell. So then you're able to rapidly conduct charge through the cell. Now by increasing the membrane resistance, we also reduce our time constant. So it's actually harder to depolarize that region. So we can't wrap the entire nerve axon in myelin or else we will just lose our charge because no areas are depolarizing. So what the nerve axon actually does is that it will just wrap certain portions with myelin like here, here, and here. So then depolarization can occur in this regions with sodium entering the cell, causing a positive charge here, which can then rapidly spread across to this next region, then stimulating sodium to enter the cell here, depolarizing this region, allowing that current to quickly spread across. So this rapid spread or jumping of charge down the nerve axon is called saltatory conduction, and it occurs due to these areas which are not myelinated called nodes of Ranvier. So saltatory conduction occurs due to myelination of our nerve axons, which are also pretty large in diameter, which helps to increase our conduction velocity, allowing our nerve signals to be spread quite rapidly. So that goes over the basics of our nerve axon action potentials and the spread of action potentials. Next, we have to talk about the actual spread of a signal from one nerve cell to the next nerve cell or from one nerve cell to the muscle or the effector muscle. And that occurs at a synapse, which is where this information is transmitted from one cell to another. There's two types of synapses, an electrical synapse or a chemical synapse. An electrical synapse is called essentially a gap junction. This is where just two cells connect to one another at one certain portion where there is low resistance. So then this electrical charge can spread straight through it. So a gap junction is an electrical synapse and that occurs at our cardiac muscle and smooth muscle where the electrical impulse has to travel from cell to cell as you'll see later on in this textbook. Chemical synapses 
is represented over here in figure 116, where you can actually see there's a gap between the presynaptic nerve and then the postsynaptic nerve. So a synapse is almost just like a little gap between the two, where a chemical signal has to transfer across the gap to propagate an action potential on the other side, or to actually inhibit a signal from being transmitted. So this is how a signal goes from your fingertips to your brain through multiple different nerve cells it occurs by going through these different synapses which gets that signal to where it needs to go because there will be multiple synapses on that pathway so the first move here is that the action potential moves down the nerve bringing with it a positive charge that stimulates the opening of calcium channel so then calcium can then enter into the presynaptic nerve terminal the entering of calcium then stimulates the release of acetylcholine or whatever neurotransmitter or chemical to then be released from the presynaptic terminal. So a neurotransmitter then gets released, it then passes this gap or the synaptic cleft to then interact with a carrier protein on the postsynaptic terminal to then open this channel and allow the movement of ions. If it's excitatory, then it allows the movement of sodium and potassium and ultimately the sodium enters in and we end up with a end plate potential of about negative 50 or so, which then stimulates threshold and thus an action potential can be spread down this axon. So we transmit the action potential from this nerve to this nerve or this carrier protein may actually open up chloride channels. So then that actually allows chloride to enter the cell, which will actually hyperpolarize the cell and inhibit this nerve axon. So we stop the signal from propagating. Once this chemical or this neurotransmitter here represented by acetylcholine has stimulated this receptor here, it then gets broken down by acetylcholine esterase. The choline then gets recycled to form more acetylcholine. So that is how a signal is spread from one cell to the other cell. Now, one action potential may not directly stimulate an action potential on the other side if it is an excitatory action potential. We need the motor end plate to accumulate enough charge to then reach threshold to then allow propagation of a nerve impulse. So we may need actually multiple action potentials from this nerve to stimulate an action potential or just one action potential from this nerve. When we need multiple in succession, that is called temporal summation. Or we may need multiple axons here or multiple synapses all stimulating this one post synaptic terminal at the same time to stimulate an action potential. And when we need multiple at the same time, that's called spatial summation to then stimulate another action potential. Because synapses may be one to one, it may be multiple to one, or it could be one to multiple. So if it's one to one, then clearly that's a simple transmission of an impulse or a simple inhibition of an impulse. If it's multiple to one, then we're actually causing convergence of multiple signals into one area. Or if it's one to multiple, then it's divergence. We're sending the signal to multiple areas. Now this figure is actually showing us a motor neuron where we have an action potential going to a muscle neuron to stimulate a muscle cell. So this is going from a nerve to a muscle, depolarization of the motor end plate to then cause an action potential in the muscle cell to cause contraction. We will go over muscle contraction in the next video. So this is the basics of a chemical synapse. We have a signal coming across, we have a neurotransmitter that crosses the jump, and then we will either have depolarization or inhibition of the post-terminal synapse if the signal is strong enough. Now we we can have some issues at this area. For instance, botulism actually stops the release of those acetylcholine neurotransmitters. So there is no signal transmitted, which causes paralysis because we can't move. And then we also get a problem called Mycena gravis, where there's an immune response against these guys here. So we don't get enough signal across, which you can treat by actually providing an inhibitor of this enzyme here. So we have an accumulation of acetylcholine to try to get as much signal in as much as possible. Now these disease processes, obviously there's a little bit more to them. This is a physiology textbook, we won't kind of cover that too much here. And then we've gone over the excitatory postsynaptic terminals, open up sodium potassium channels. And excitatory neurotransmitters that do that are acetylcholine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, glutamate, and serotonin. These cause depolarization of those postsynaptic terminals. And then inhibitory postsynaptic potentials 
hyperpolarize the postsynaptic terminal by opening up chloride channels. The main two there are GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid and glycine are the two inhibitory neurotransmitters. We've gone over spatial summation where you need multiple presynaptic action potentials at the same time versus temporal summation which is just multiple in succession. And then we have these other phenomena like uh, for instance facilitation, augmentation and post tetanic potentiation are a similar phenomena here where repeated stimulation causes increased response in the postsynaptic cell thought to be because of an increased neurotransmitter within the synapse and an accumulation of calcium in the presynaptic terminal. We have long-term potentiation which is a storage of memories essentially so there is an exaggerated response to the same signal and then we have synaptic fatigue where now repeated stimulation has now exhausted our neurotransmitters so now we result in a less or a lower response to the same signal. There is a little bit more information on all of these neurotransmitters, which I doubt you would need to know, but if you do need to know, then you kind of go over it in your own time. Really the main thing here is that acetylcholine is a very common one, and it's the only one at the neuromuscular junction, so between nerve cells and muscles. We have four kind of groupings, so choline esters is your acetylcholine, biogenic amines, amino acids, and neuropeptides. The main difference here for neuropeptides is that they are created in the actual nerve cell body and then transported to the synapse through the nerve axon, whereas the other neurotransmitters are all created at the actual presynaptic terminal to then cross over that synaptic cleft. Now, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine are all similar because they're all created from tyrosine, and then just more metabolism results in each one. As you can see, tyrosine turns into L-dopa, then to dopamine, then norepinephrine, then epinephrine. Now, histamine is another one that's created in mast cells. Serotonin is created from tryptophan. Serotonin and norepinephrine, etc., can get broken down from monoamine oxidase, and then there's another one called COMT. Uh, glutamate is a major excitatory neurotransmitter in your actual central nervous system. Glycine and GABA being our two inhibitory ones. And then nitric oxide, which is a short-acting inhibitory neurotransmitter in the GI tract and central nervous system. And then we have a very long list of neuropeptides. As I mentioned, they're synthesized in the nerve cell body. Now, neuromodulators are a type of neuropeptide which alters the amount of neurotransmitter released in response to stimulation. Then neurohormones are actually released from secretory cells and can go through the blood to act at distal sites. But in these cases, secretory cells are actually the neurons themselves. And then lastly here, we have purines, which is really just ATP or the byproducts of ATP. Now, all of those neurotransmitters, it goes into a little bit more detail than I, th I think you would need to know, but it just depends on which particular course you are in. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Next up we're going to go over skeletal muscle. If you'd like to get downloadable audio files of these chapters then you can do so by becoming a Patreon or you can just support the channel that way. Otherwise feel free to drop a comment and we'll see you in the next video.